Ladies and gentlemen, we are resuming. You, you can still send your questions to sli.do. And the next speaker is Mr. Blahinka. Ladies and gentlemen, Great Britain is far away, so it seems uh, we shouldn't be too concerned, but that's not true. This is uh, GDP per capita of selected countries. Austria, France, Italy, Spain, and the red line stands for Germany, and the blue one for the Czech Republic. In 1990, we were told we would be on par with Germany in 20 years. In, indeed, we are at the level of Germany in 1990. And in, in fact, the distance between the two countries isn't diminishing, rather the contrary. The European Union uh, in general experienced its periods of growth and uh, followed by a period of stagnancy. While the the U.S. <clears throat> curve is quite flat, quite linear, the European Union, including our country, has had its ups and downs. This this is the point of signature of the Lisbon Treaty, which affected the subsequent development of the Union. The Brits have decided to solve the problem by Brexit. This certainly is going to affect the European Union. Uh, if you figure uh, the Union as a train, Uh, the leading countries, that's, uh, the, uh, those five stand for 70 percent of the EU's GDP, uh, uh, fo followed by countries such as Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, the Netherlands, and so forth. Eight countries, 19 percent, followed by countries such as the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, Nine countries with 9% GDP trailed by the last six countries with 2% GDP. Now, if we take a look at the farming GDP, it's slightly different. Uh, and if we take the population, you can see the locomotives have 62 percent of the European population, followed by 12 percent for the second class countries, and so forth. If, if you uh, relate that to uh, the, the population to the agricultural GDP, uh, its level in the locomotives. This is the chart of self-sufficiency in 
farm produce or in foodstuffs related to the population. Denmark 263%, followed by uh, the Netherlands 187%, down to the Czech Republic 66%, and uh, the UK only 53%. What happens if, if we disconnect one locomotive, that is the UK? The farming uh, GDP will, will drop to only 55. Uh, it will only drop to 55, while the population will drop to 50. Who is going to balance it out? Two percent is going, as as we envisage, two percent is going to be taken by the UK, even if they have to pay customs duties and the like. Again, uh, let us take the productivity of uh, uh, farm work. You, you can see that the Danish productivity is 510, followed by Belgium 424, down to, the, uh, to Czechia 122, Slovakia 102, and at the bottom is Bulgaria and Romania with 30 and 22 percent respectively. So the difference is formidable. One farmer in Denmark generates the same production as four farmers in the Czech Republic, 15 in Poland and 25 in Romania. So who is going to balance out the deficit, not the leaders. If we take a look at, at, at the last few, they would not be able to carry the burden. So let us take uh, the Visegrad countries. They stand for 10 percent of farming GDP of the European Union. If we take 30 percent out, if we reduce it to 7, we would be able to make for the deficit. Now we've been talking about the faulty foodstuffs from Poland and reduced subsidies from EU. That's no news today. Taking a look at individual commodities for France, Germany and Austria. The surplus of, of cereals, surplus of meat and milk. We are going to reduce the production. Why? Because the supermarkets are managed from their home countries and uh, the produce is easy to transport to our country. It would be more difficult to transport the same to Bulgaria. How vulnerable are we? Uh, GDP in agriculture makes 104 billion, and 30% uh, of that is covered by subsidies. We suffered a reduction in the 1990s. This is a comparison of uh, 2017 to 1989. Dairy production 
61%. Production of uh, livestock, 48%. Cereals, 81%. Pigs, 32 percent. So, how to go on? Should we, should we oppose further reductions of, of farming? Yes. But uh, can we expect to be successful? Well, remember the train. We cannot expect much. We, we can expect the subsidies in Czechia to be either reduced or abolished completely, while the subsidies will continue in other countries of the EU. That would be de detrimental to our agriculture. Who is going to succeed? Those who, those capable of radical reduction of costs at least by 30 percent. How? To automate as much as possible or to introduce new technologies. To go from farms to uh, greenhouses. There are such greenhouses already in the world. This is what it looks like. Hmm. This is such a farm in New Jersey, USA. which produces about as much quantity of vegetables from uh, 0.6 hectare as uh, check fields on 230 hectares. Let's take another point of view. It is estimated that the average temperature should grow by 2% till 2050. That will significantly reduce the quantity of available water. Industry is consuming 19% of uh, available water. Uh, households consume 11, and uh, the rest is used by agriculture. That, again, speaks in favor of uh, greenhouses, where water can be recycled and a lot of it saved. The UN has declared a new religion, and that is environment. The, the framework agreement has been ratified by 186 countries. What does that imply for the Czech Republic? We, we, we should reduce the, the CO2 surplus down to zero by 2050. In the Czech Republic, that would mean a reduction of emissions by 14.5 million tons by 2030. Trans of, of this transport takes about 16.5 million tons, while agriculture takes 1.2 million. If, uh, 
if we shift to electric uh, propulsion of vehicles, then we will not be able to drive much because uh, there will not be enough electricity. This is where we import from. It's a waste of energy, and we are not going to be able to afford that. So that uh, brings us to vertical halls with local transport. They should be dispersed throughout the territory of the country. Basically, we will eat what we, uh, where we grow it. And uh, that is relatively independent on climate. You can, uh, you can produce in the Sahara as well as in Greenland. You can ignore seasons. The vertical halls, uh, greenhouses, in, involve no chemistry, basically. They are closed, so there will be hardly any pests. It will be clean. The Americans filled the produce into bags uh, filled with nitrogen to minimize waste. We presume that in the future vertical holes will produce everything, not only vegetables, fruit, wine, linen, everything. And I dare say that they'll produce meat or surrogate of meat which will be invented by them. Looking back to the history, Slushevitsa at 1981 built a hall with controlled atmosphere and there was a hydroponic grain production with 3.2 crops a year. That was the first vertical hall in the world. Then the system sort of slipped and when Fukushima exploded and it was impossible to grow in the fields, the Japanese started using this system and today after 10 years they have systems which economically are working. Of course those first models are usually working with a loss. We have a high quality researchers, but we need to foster new species to be planted in halls. We need to come with new technologies, fixations, chemistry, parameter of climate, etc. It's a lot of work. Today, main career are USA, Japan, Great Britain, but I think that we can do that as well. One vertical hole I've shown you in New Jersey is 50 times 60 meters and produces 800 tons of vegetables a year. Here, 13,000 people could live on that. So. Czech Republic would need 750 vertical halls for complete supply of vegetables. Like Brno, 600,000 inhabitants would have 46 halls. Where to get money for vertical halls? Because, because it's not cheap it's worth one billion. So for 750 holes, 750 billions. Who's got it? For instance, Czech National Bank. Czech National Bank in 2017 spent uselessly 950 billions to cut the
exchange rates to 27 crowns. So if there is a good will, 750 billion should be found. By the way, Czech National Bank owns 3 trillion 120 billion. And what about the European Union? Christian Lagarde, the president of ECB, declared that she'll continue in quantitative releasing and which is basically money printing and she'll add up 20 billion euros, it means 500 billions per month into the circulation. Part of the money should be used to buy company bonds and that should help to cut emissions. Who will be a recipient of this money? Only few farmers, because there are certain preconditions. If you want to credit with the bank, the equity is 20%. Equity is your own money, and 70 to 80% will be given by the bank. If we look at GDP of the Czech Republic, which is 104 billion crowns, I can't imagine putting together 750 billion. So, how to do that? There was a similar situation in the 60s because farmers didn't have money to buy mechanization. And co ops earned money for mechanization, and I believe that situation simply repeats itself. Large industrial companies will have agricultural protection in halls. Why in halls? Because industrial protection will be curbed. There will be empty halls and what to do with them. Companies will look for protection and this is what they could do in their empty halls. Transformation to vertical farms concerns the whole EU, fighting the lack of water and transportation limitations are the task which for us farmers will be imposed and to survive we have to invest into intensification of agricultural production. So what's the way out? You need to join forces with industrial companies because we are those who can do full steps and they have their homes. Thank you for the attention. Well, thank you. And now the Mr. Martin Picha, the chairman of the Agricultural Union. Well, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I must say I'm really pleased when Mr. Blahinka was showing me the train and that we were at least in the first class, that we were not at the end. Just to say about vertical farms, well, actually, it will be interesting for farmers, but not only we cut down numbers of cattle, we've reduced agricultural production, but we've managed to reduce know-how. So we no longer have a research institute which would dedicate their efforts to growing vegetables. And we no longer have people who could learn farmers how to grow vegetables. So we have to go back to getting experts 
Let's talk about my presentation, how Europe is trading with agricultural commodities. I was asked to mention that, so thank you for the invitation. And my presentation is cut into four parts. First, we'll touch upon trends. I'll follow up to four speakers. Second, Europe as an important foodstuff producer. Number three, Europe getting more and more open. And last one, competitiveness in Europe. So, this is the slide showing the influence on Czech agricultural production. Let me mention just a couple of points. Number one, this is a study called Metadata Study, published by EC, and it speaks about estimates of growth of production of foodstuffs. Of course, there are several aspects, not only environmental and economic aspects, but also the change of consuming habits of inhabitants or how to replace meat. You know that there are vegetarian hamburgers and we will not produce meat and animals will not be bred in fields but in the lab. So, still, the consumption of foodstuffs will increase. And if you look at figures, grain should raise by 24%, corn 33%, rice increase by 33%, poultry 4 pork 10 and cattle 34%. I'm speaking about cattle because people are discussing whether we should reduce counts of cattle because they are emitting greenhouse gases. This is something which is highly improbable and the demand for cattle will increase. However, this is the reality and we keep hearing this problem. And those people are speaking about the environmental protection and they do not take into consideration other aspects like if you reduce the number of cattle, then the further area will decrease and the organic mass in the soil will disappear. It means the soil itself will deteriorate. So this is the consumption of foodstuffs, both meat and plants in those circles, showing development till 2030. And it's kilocalorie per day per person. The dark ones, developing countries, the large circle, developed countries. So you see that the circle is not increasing too much. What's more interesting is those uh, levels, uh, sorry, columns. If you look at columns, this shows consumption of foodstuffs in China and you see the growth and today the animal protection came close to countries like US, Europe, 
This is Europe, 925 calories and the richest industrial countries. Next to China, these are the least developed countries in a given year. And even this is growing. And those predictions are that if HIEs will dream his own American dream, we will need 1.5 billion tons of grain each and every year, it, which is still more than it was published in a study published by the EC. What I'm trying to say is that we are in a situation when the list of consumption is growing. And to speak in this relation that we have to curb intensity of agriculture in Europe seems like a nonsense because there is a demand and someone's going to cover it. A couple of figures, I'll skip it because it would take too long. Just one. This is specific figure. A Chinese in town consume 30 kilo of meat, milk and eggs and 2011 it was nearly 50, it means nearly twice as much. Information, basic information about possible development of appropriate arable land for foodstuffs production. Even if there is a degradation of agricultural land, this study based on FAO presumes that there will be an increase of arable land by 5%, 70 million hectares, and the extension will be done in Africa and Latin America. And in relation to Mercosur, it's no surprise, and they will burn out rainforests to create arable land, and they will plant plants covering the demand for foodstuffs. EU as foodstuffs produce. My four speakers mentioned that Europe is strongly integrated into the world foodstuffs and commodities trade and it's worth 260 billion of euros in 2018 and since 2018 the value nearly doubled. There is a huge increase and Europe is the biggest exporter of foodstuffs in the world. Take EU as a whole, but the second importer of foodstuffs, but mainly basic raw materials in the world. More than 30% of raw materials are imported are out of Europe. Top world agri-food exporters, number one, European 28, second United States, third Brazil, fourth China and fourth Canada. If you look up top world agri-food importers, number one, United States, but it could be comparable to EU. China is increasing because the population is getting richer, so China increases agricultural production plus import. Japan and Canada. What's more interesting is that if we look at the structure of agro-food trade of the EU, 
You can see different colors. And what's above the black line is imports and below exports. The first two parts colored in green show basic foodstuffs. This is what Europe exports. The proportion could be 30%. And here, imported stuff. And this is a massive part. In another word, Europe is pragmatic, importing cheap raw materials, processes them for foodstuffs and gives them added value as European 28. Mr. Blahinka showed the example of flowers being transported from Kenya via Netherlands because Kenyan farmers have quite different legislative conditions. Taking a look at the exports by destination, Europe is quite successful in exporting foodstuffs to the U.S. China is second, followed by Switzerland, Japan, and the orange column stands for Russia. Uh, it shows quite a significant drop. Also in consequence to some trade sanctions. What is also interesting, and it was mentioned by Mr. Shir, Mr. Toman and Mr. Dolezal, and that is the question, uh, who affects uh, the export? If you take a look at the numbers of exporters and the, the worth of the export, you can see that the, large, the largest share is that of the large agribusinesses. It says th this stands for the medium size establishments and the uh, you know, small and micro ones. That is quite a discrepancy. So if uh, Europe sets the agriculture policy by reducing subsidies to large businesses and uh, helping the small ones, then uh, uh, the large, large businesses uh, will be harmed and they uh, are very important uh, suppliers to the domestic market as well. The largest importer today, uh, uh, the largest import today is from the United States, which has uh, surpassed the imports from Brazil. The Brazilian exports to the European Union uh, have dropped, while the U.S. export has increased. Ukraine and Argentina are quite important importers as well. If you add Argentina to Brazil, you will get a very important share in the import of uh, foodstuffs, especially raw materials. Well, Europe uh, is increasingly open. The Union is negotiating trade agreements with more and more countries. It looks quite clever at first sight. 
importing uh, cheap raw materials, processing them, adding value. That's positive for Europe. It may look like that. The question is, who do we sign agreements with? And what's the outcome of it? We have agreements with 120 countries of the world, uh, negotiating with more. Mercosur is just about to conclude. Vietnam, Chile, and others, including Ukraine. We should take into account another thing. What's going on here may look very positive macroeconomically, but uh, it greatly affects the prices of the final products. which uh, reduces the profitability of European agriculture. Costs are growing, production stagnates, basically. Taking a look at the uh, agribusiness of the European Union with Ukraine, imports, as you can see, uh, massively consist of uh, raw materials. And if we take a look at the structure of uh, agrarian business uh, with the EU countries, then uh, we do not look very well. We export livestock, live, dairy products, we import meat products, and meat itself constitutes one half of the uh, negative uh, balance of uh, our agro-trade. So, by exporting raw materials, basically, similarly to Ukraine or Mercosur, uh, the, uh, the imports can have a very significant effect on our agriculture. Europe imported 22 billion euros worth of foodstuffs from Mercosur, and we only exported there about 2.5 billion worth. This is the structure of agro-trade of the European Union with Brazil. It seemingly, it, it, it's just a small fraction of our total consumption, so the market should be able to absorb it. But it affects prices, and we should also beware that the Czech customer minds price very much, while a French consumer is buying French cheese and uh, is not interested in Czech uh, cheese at all. The Czech customer uh, wants to buy cheap. I have taken only one commodity from Mercosur uh, to show the competitive position of uh, the European and Brazilian producers of poultry. The Brazilian price is a half of that in Europe. Uh, 
the import amounts to the total of uh, the domestic production of Finland, Denmark, and Sweden. And uh, there's a great difference in phytosanitary protection and other elements. This is a comparison between Europe, the US, and Brazil. Here are production costs by the country. And the, the European Union is the highest column. Another subject we should reduce pesticides. The Commission is going to publish the pledge of uh, pesticide reduction by 2030. I, I like targets, but uh, we should be aware of uh, how we arrive at the target when there's no replacement. It could be devastating look at the use of pesticides in the countries we've been talking about. They all use more pesticides per hectare than the European Union. So, by this target we can uh, increase the costs on the part of the farmers, we can reduce profit, we can reduce, uh, we will reduce market. Because of the prohibition in effect in the European Union, but we can, uh, can hardly control this in other parts of the world. So this is why we uh, refuse the, this kind of agreement. It may not affect the West European farmers very much, but it will affect uh, Czech agriculture. I'll dwell on this. This is a graph I showed to the MEPs last week. We all, we all talk about uh, subsidies per area, not mentioning that uh, all the farmers have to comply with the so-called basic conditionalities. Uh, there is, uh, the payments per area involve certain costs. In Germany, it's 315 euros per hectare. And the average payment in Germany is a little less than 300. And that has to do with such countries as the US, Mercosur, New Zealand, and the like. So this is the cost of compliance with the basic conditions as against the countries to which we are opening up. That suggests that we cannot expect this is not going to affect our farmers if we reduce the subsidies on uh, CAP we reduce the compensation and open the market, it will inevitably affect uh, the competitiveness of European agriculture. Every month, uh, 1,000 farmers 
wrap it up. This is uh, the breakdown to individual areas, needless to describe. Uh, when talking about support and subsidies, let us see what subsidies the farmers enjoy in Brazil. The Brazilian farming budget altogether is 47 billion euros per year. The Brazilian Minister of Agriculture decided to invest 8.5 billion euros into animal husbandry. So we are going to reduce production because of the greenhouse gas emissions, while the Brazilians will increase their production. Brazil is spending 234 euros per citizen on uh, its uh, agribusiness. And my time is up, so I'll, I will not describe subsidies in the United States. And uh, Uh, I'll spend a few words on the concentration of uh, farm production because that has to do with competitiveness. In the United States, the uh, total, total number of slaughterhouses uh, was reduced from 10,000 to 3,000 from 1967 to 2,000. The Brazilian JBS, the, which is the largest meat processor in the world, is able to slaughter 85,000 uh, cattle. And let us take a look at the number of uh, uh, pig producers in the U.S. The, the number of producers was reduced by 70 percent from 1992 to 2009 while keeping the amount of production. Uh, Europe says, let, let us remove the large concentrated uh, establishments and prefer nice small farms. But, but who is going to do this kind of business and uh, how can they sell the products? This runs contrary to the trends worldwide. The, the number of uh, dairy cows in Bavaria dropped 35 percent in the last 10 years. Competitiveness is a problem, which is why uh, the German dairy businesses like to buy Czech milk because the quality is fine and it's safe. And this is the last graph. Seemingly favorable trade agreements uh, affect the prices of uh, producers. The prices have hardly grown at all. About 30 percent, while the cost of inputs into agriculture has grown to about 500 percent. 
How long do you think farmers will be able to stand this? If the income, the of an average farmer in the European Union is at 42 percent of the average income in general. It is not as serious in Czechia. It's about 75 percent. Uh, seemingly, we are well off, but uh, we miss young people to join in. So if we keep on uh, pressing on farmers uh, because of the environmental requirements, uh, believing that the, uh, that the farmers will carry the burden, I don't think this can last very long. Thank you for your attention. I'm open to your questions. Uh, and uh, when we are at statistics, uh, I can tell you that you have been 71% longer than uh, you should have been. Mr. Zitniak is the next speaker. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm happy that you have invited me. And I'm going to speak about the safety of labor. That concerns everyone, and we have to cope with it. Perhaps it's worth asking whether it's a burden for entrepreneur or whether it's possible to have a good system of safety and security. I have 20 minutes, and within these three, 20 minutes, in the EU, six people die, may it be occupational accident or occupational disease. Each 3.5 minutes, a man dies. So the question is whether to invest into safety or not. Those directives we have, which farmers have to be in line with are 30 years old, 89391 about the safety of labor, and the second amended 2006 from 42. Originally, it was 89. 391. It means 30 years we've been having these directives. And we have new ones. And these are implementing. implementing. These are implementing directives. So, are on the top, 89.391 concerns safety of work. It means it concerns each and every employer. Most of you are employers, if not your managers. So all these directives gradually were ratified by the Czech Republic or you should be in line with them. Perhaps Neil, you don't know that. This slide shows 2006-42. Perhaps this doesn't tell you anything, but each of you every day is looking at a tag on a supply uh, appliance you buy or anything else and it's a tag which tells you that the appliance you buy 
went through the inspection and it wouldn't hurt you. So you are meeting that even if you didn't own a hypnosemical efficacy. Of course, the, there is a mess because the new directives, they are amended. And just imagine that each employer, may he employ one or 100 people, would resolve production at 2 hectares or 5,000 hectares. And all these directives must be introduced. And you need to realize that agriculture as such, when the EC is assessing us based on statistics, we are ranking among four worse sectors. In terms of accidents, we are by 30% above the European average. There are lots of directives, you know, you have to get around in them, but agriculture with specific feature it has, has this great problem to cut down the causes of incidents. This is the most obvious causes of death in agriculture. And if we speak about specifics or problematics area, there are machines and mechanic appliances which are moving in the field and when the machine is moving outside, it influences their technical features, the safety of protection. We are not always moving around solid, flat surface. There are sloping surfaces as well. And then working with animals, you never know what the animal will do. So it ranks among the most dangerous areas. And seasonality, if you look at this graph, in May, we are harvesting the fodder, then sugar beet, it's seasonality of field works from the viewpoint of accidents is very difficult. Of course, moving around the field made on slope terrain and huge volumes which are being transported that all influences the rate of accidents in agriculture. That's why we'll get very hardly at an average level. Within statistics, the accident rate is dropping but number of employees is all, also dropping. And if you calculate 1,000 employees, you see that it's not dropping at all, because what's dropping is number of people, but the rate of accident is not. I said that the basic directive, the framework directive, which we all know, is reflected into our companies and we can say that there is a process of risk management which gives us procedures how to do that. 
to identify the danger, assessment of risk, risk management, and that all supports other standards from British standard and ISO 45001. The same way we resolve quality, also the security and safety has its own ISO standard. And if we want to be a quality manager, and if we want to manage accident rate, we need to be able to know all these directives. Those directives and standards speak about procedures which have to be taken into consideration, like criteria to identify danger, criteria to assess the processes. Not everyone can do that, and there is a certain frequency in which you need to do that. And what's also important, and majority of employers forget that, is to involve employer, employees, because we want to have a management system, and we can't do that without employees. So we need to have trade unions or representative of employees who is in charge of safety and security. So identifying risks and dangers, this is quite a simple example. The basic identification noise, vibrations, biological factors, physical load, heat and cold. This is what the employer should consider in operating this line. The process should analyze the dust content and also we should use the content of the directive 98-24, and it identifies acceptable risks from the viewpoint of solid particles and aerosols, and noise. Yet another directive speaking about acceptable risk. Is it in line or not? Should we introduce systems of measuring noise? so that we would know whether we are in line or not. The red line, what's all above the line is an acceptable risk. It means the noise look burden for the operator. The blue line speaks about burden on the environment. And this is still more complex than the line from the viewpoint of citizens who are in certain distance from the machine. Results. On the first slide, uh, there was a corn, now there's a wheat, and um, the noise is by four decibels lower. No, cleaning machines, and the noise is above 80 decibels, which based on the directive, lower threshold for noise. If you look at individual, individual photographs, The very state of the machine, and of course that the directive stipulates that there should be a protective cover. And in the first place, you can't see that there is no cover. The producer 
is introducing blocking system. If the cover is down, the machine automatically blocks, and the red arrow shows the blocking. Facility and someone simply fixed it by a wire so that the cover couldn't be blocked off. If you have an inspection at your facility, you walk around and fix it, but if someone measures that, if there is unexpected inspection, then in many companies it looks like this. And then we wonder that the result of dust articles, particles, measurement are low. Instead of three, it's 6.6. .6. And the employee is exposed to occupational disease. Of course, the second part is risk assessment, either by measuring or by subjective measure. The easiest way is the method of points, just probability, giving points from 1 to 20, minimum risk is 1, maximum risk 20. If you consider individual facilities and look at the table, usually you get from here to here. But all directives speak about the fact that simply after we accept measures, we still have to improve. It's like a dimming cycle, constant improvement of working conditions. We have to go on. If we adopt one measure, we have to do inspection of another. So we need to manage the risk. Risk management is the very basis of directives. And the risk is manageable only below acceptable threshold. Here you can see acceptable risk. And what's above is an acceptable risk. So when we use the method, the red column is acceptable after risk management. Of course, principles of safe labor. Employees are entitled to have a safe working environment. On the other hand, the employee should work safely. The question is, how should he work safely if we are not capable of giving him instructions, if we do not create safe working environment, even the employee himself wouldn't know how to work safely. So each employer should think about instructing employee about safe working procedures. Of course, preventive measures are necessary and inspections at the workplace are necessary as well. This is the task of the employer. And if he is doing it, the employee is working safely and there will be less accidents. 
There is a tangle of directives, and even if we have them for 30 years, even if they were improved, still we are not able to get at least the European average from the accident rate. They are pointing me that my time's out. So, what expects us in the future? International Organization of Labor. We have technological innovations 4.0. We'll be working on warm planet. What does it mean? Either it will be too hot for our people to work or they will work slower. It depends on the working environment. Next, prognosis of the International Labour Organization. The less of productivity due to heat stress. Three times as much time. There are tables showing the te temperature, 35, 40. These tables up to 30 percent. And the next problem, T index. Not only the heat, but humidity is affecting the body. <laughs> Uh, and then there are smart technologies, navigation, which reduces stress, reduces uh, fatigue. Yes, that's all fine. But uh, that brings about new risks, such as psychosocial stress and so forth. Uh, oh. collision of a machine against the barrier and other factors. It's up to us how to solve these problems. Uh, and uh, then if you take, the, take robots or self-driving machines, And the ultimate question is whether the, there are going to be any people left willing to work in agriculture. Uh, workers in agriculture were not uh, required to be educated at a higher level, uh, while we cannot uh, put up with this lenience, you know. Of course, we, we need financing, but uh, we also need quality equipment. We need involvement of uh, the workforce in tackling the problems of work safety. Without that, it will be uh, very difficult to attract uh, young people to farming. We've been tackling the problem at our college and uh, contemplating how to raise awareness among the young people about the opportunities and the requirements, <coughs> coping with temperatures is certainly important, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, but we have to rely on people and perhaps uh, trade unions 
they need to understand, they need to, first of all, to want to understand. Uh, they can be helped, but quite often they resist help. So let us contemplate all these factors so that we can go back home and spend uh, the holidays in peace. Thank you. We still have a short time for questions. Mr. Picha, uh, what, what do you think uh, in, inspires the negative view of agriculture from the point of view of uh, environmental protection? Media uh, love to uh, inform about what is alarming or disastrous. Uh, some figures are alarming indeed, such as uh, decrease of biodiversity, uh, temperature changes, uh, circulation of water, and many people want to be heard. So. They write worst scenarios. It is much less attractive to offer positive information. The media prefer negative information. This is not to say that the, the media are not objective. But they tend to prefer what uh, is uh, good reading stuff for their readership. They need readers, and they need to. Uh, they, they need advertising to sell to the readers. But the effect uh, on the farmers could be negative because the the farmers may say uh, we we have complied with all that is required of us, and yet uh, it is not enough. And the. Educative information also runs against the politicians who also want to ride the wave of ne negative information and the emotions. Uh, we need to be rationalistic. Now, a question to Mr. Blahinka, uh, interest groups uh, uh, that uh, want to return to nature are increasingly listened to. What do you think of it? Well, the development has been as I described it. We expect uh, uh, that the uh, manual labor uh, isn't going to be wanted anymore. The industry will release a lot of labor, and that will be available uh, for new, uh, new, new businesses, new kinds of business. Agriculture is going to become just another industry. Thank you. The last question to Mr. Picha. Don't you think that the, the, the support of, of small and medium-sized businesses will reduce export, but uh, will uh, improve the chances for local and regional foodstuffs? 
Thank you. I think we should <coughs> focus on two groups. One, smaller farmers who are able to finalize their production and sell it on local market. That's uh, bypassing uh, economic pressures from uh, food processing industry and uh, uh, retail chains. And they can, uh, in fact, cash in a greater profit. The, the other group are larger farmers who uh, may engage in the same kind of activity. Uh, they will not be able to sell on the local market uh, uh, such large-scale uh, productions as <coughs> animal husbandry with thousands of animals. They have to sell to dairy plants and face the retail chains. Sole orientation on the, on the local market would be no good. And uh, on the other hand, if we only focus on the global market, the, the small ones would end up. So that's what uh, what Czech uh, farming is like. It's a dual problem. Well, let me thank all the speakers. Now we are going to have a short uh, coffee break, not half an hour, but just 20 minutes. So we'll resume in 20 minutes. Gentlemen, let us start with the last series of presentations. Here, the president uh, of French company, uh, Safa, Monsieur Yest, and uh, Mr. Jeguzo from the same company. Hello, I'm very pleased to be here in Praha to this conference. Uh, I am a French farmer in Normandy, and I am the president of the SAFER in France. Uh, the SAFER is a, a company, and we explain after uh, what is this company, who the, the principal uh, rules is uh, the protection of the land and the regulation of the uh, use of the land. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I work, I, I, uh, I work with uh, Mr. Yast. I'm a research engineer in, uh, in the National Federation of Safer. And uh, we are here to present you uh, what Safer are. Uh, and what, what is their role in the regulation of land markets in France. So we'll see uh, a presentation in three parts. First I will present you what SAFER are, uh, then we'll see what they actually do for uh, the regulation of land markets in France, and in the third part we'll see the challenges for uh, French agriculture and rural territories. So let's begin with the presentation of SAFER. SAFER, briefly, uh, they were created at the beginning of the 1960s. They're non-profit private companies in charge of public service missions. They act on rural land market in favor of, of farmers' projects and farmers' settlement policies, but also uh, in favor of environmental issues and economical development. No, uh, not only agricultural, but rural uh, economical development. Uh, farmers, representatives, and local authorities take part in the board of directors of every SAFER, and the French government controls the activity of every uh, SAFER. So you can see on this map that there are actually 13 SAFER in continental France. Uh, there are 13 regions in France, and there is one SAFER per region. 
and there are also three SAFER overseas and uh, another one in construction also overseas. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Yest is the president of uh, Normandy, the SAFER of Normandy. is the president of this SAFER and the president of the National Federation of SAFER. So let's travel a little back into the past to understand uh, why and how SAFER were created in France. After the Second World War, uh, there was a food shortage uh, in France. There were seven million people living out on farming, but there was also a huge rural urban migration. Uh, a lot of people uh, leaving uh, the rural area towards uh, cities. There were two million parcelled out farms with an average size of only 15 hectares. I say only because nowadays the average size is 63 in France. Uh, there was a young farmers movement, uh, very strong, uh, who wanted better life conditions for farmers and they also wanted uh, a modernized agriculture. And there was a project of European common market that was created in 57. So the French state at that time and young farmers uh, shared the will uh, of modernizing the farm structures in order to increase food production, to make French agriculture competitive, to reach a decent, a decent standard of living in comparison to urban areas, and uh, to promote a two working unit family farms. So SAFER uh, were, created, were created at that time um, and they were part of a, of a strong policy uh, that began in 1946 when the rules on land tenancies were created and they are still implemented nowadays. Uh, SAFER were created in 1960 in order to regulate the farmland market and two years later, uh, a preemption right was granted to SAFER in order to reinforce their capacity to control and uh, allocate land. I will uh, speak of these rights a little bit later. Nowadays, these are the four missions fulfilled by SAFER. The first one is the historical mission. Um, that was the only one mission uh, when they were created, which is the development of and the protection of agricultural and forest areas. Uh, and then uh, came other missions. The second one uh, in the history was local development, uh, which is the third one on, on this slide. And uh, there is also the environmental and landscape protection, which is uh, the second mission on, on this slide. And the fourth mission is the rural land market transparency. Uh, I will tell you a little bit more of this uh, mission. What you need to understand is that uh, SAFER nowadays doesn't only um, address agricultural uh, issues, they really address rural issues, uh, agricultural, environmental or uh, development issues. Uh, a little bit about uh, SAFER status, uh, so they are private limited companies but with a, a public service missions. They are non-profitable, that means that no dividends can be distributed to shareholders. They are subject to public authorities agreement and they are under the control of the French state with uh, two ministries, uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Finance. About their governance, uh, there is one board of directors for uh, every SAFER, uh, maximum 24 members, distributed into three colleges, uh, one third for uh, every college. Uh, these colleges represent uh, every um, actor of the rural world. So you have the first college is, um, uh, is constituted with representative farmers unions and elected farming organizations. The second college uh, uh, is constituted with uh, local authorities, uh, cities, departments, regions. And the third college uh, is constituted with the French state, with the National uh, Federation of SAFER, environmental organizations, banks, hunters, unions. So this board of directors gives an agreement on all purchases, sales and leases uh, uh, done by the SAFER. 
So there is one board of director for every sapphire, and the, the, the most important place in every sapphire is what we call the departmental technical committee. There, is, uh, there are around 100 departments in France, and so there is uh, nearly one departmental technical committee for, uh, uh, for, for each department. So there are 95 uh, committees in France. This is what we call uh, the land democracy. Uh, this is really where the land democracy is. Um, it is the place where um, uh, all the members of this committee who uh, represent the shareholders, the local representative of the shareholders and of the free state, decide, well, give an, give an opinion on all uh, what Safer can uh, buy and sell after uh, analyzing all uh, applications. Because in France, you, the SAFER first has to uh, publish public announcements to say, we have uh, this land to sell, for instance. Any person can uh, send an application, can be candidate to buy this land. And, though, uh, and then the technical committee gives an opinion and say, I think we should sell this land to Mr. Dupont because he has the better project for the territory. So this committee is, is really what we call the land democracy uh, committee. It gives an opinion and then uh, this opinion is uh, agreed by the board of directors. What is the role of the French state in SAFER? Uh, French state accredits legal status, president and director. He accredits the long-term action program of every SAFER. He approves every preemption and every purchase superior to 75,000 euros. He approves all sales and has a veto power on every sale project. And he takes part in the board of directors and gets an overview of SAFER activity. I'm being quite quick to, in order to be able to present everything. Um, what is important to know also is uh, how SAFER can really uh, uh, act on the market. So to fulfill the four missions, software are able to buy amicable or through preemption right. So they can buy agricultural land, forests, or rural real estate, bare land or land with buildings, and they can also sh uh, buy shares of agricultural companies. Safair are able to stock land up to five years. Uh, they are able to allocate land after public announcement through sale or through uh, lease. And they can also facilitate lease between uh, a tenant uh, who is looking for a, a, um, a farmer. Uh, right, the slide, there is a, a mistake on this slide. To facilitate lease between a tenant and a farmer. Temporarily manage land of public of, or private land owners and help local authorities in their uh, rural development issues. So how uh, SAFER actually uh, do uh, for a regulation of land markets? Uh, first, you need to know that in France, we consider uh, that the regulation it can be divided into three steps, transparency, control, and allocation. The transparency is the knowledge of every uh, sale across the rural area. Control is the capacity to stop a certain kind of sales because they are not compliant with the uh, the public, uh, the public policy. And then allocation uh, is the allocation of lands towards projects uh, that are compliant with uh, these policies. So as for the transparency, uh, SAFER, every SAFER legally receives every preliminary sale contract in order to decide whether to use the preemption rights or not. For instance, last year, uh, SAFER uh, were sent uh, more than 300,000 preliminary sale contracts. They are sent by notaries. And they were also uh, sent 7,200 contracts of share deals. What do we do with all this information? At a national level, we are able to calculate and publish an official farmland mean value in partnership with the Ministry of Agriculture. We also publish an annual analysis of land markets. Uh, we do press conferences. We have uh, meetings with uh, members of parliament in order to, uh, 
to tell them uh, what we see on these markets. And at a local level, uh, it uh, also allows SAFER to uh, give local authorities a real-time knowledge of their territory. For instance, if uh, a city uh, wants to know what, what is happening in, in its territory, it can ask SAFER to transmit the information of every sale of rural estate uh, going on on, the, on his territory. Just two examples of what we do with all this data. This is an overview of uh, last year's uh, rural land market in France, divided into six uh, sub-segments. So for instance, you can see in green the arable uh, land and meadows market, 90,000 transactions for um, 400,000 hectares, for instance, and nearly 5 billion euros. So th that's just an example of what we can do with this uh, data. And the next one is the map. You recognize France, and uh, this is the price of non-rented land um, in uh, euros per hectare. So the, the price, uh, this is the official price uh, published with the, the Ministry of Agriculture based on all the transactions recorded every year. So uh, I remind you that uh, transparency for us is the first step of uh, regulation. The second step is control. And control is operated through the preemption rights. So I think it's important for you to know uh, what the preemption right is. It was granted to SAFER uh, with the 1962 law. And what it means is that it enables SAFER to stop sales of real estate who, that are considered not compliant with public policies. Uh, technically, and very, uh, it, it means that uh, if a seller uh, is, has agreed with a, a buyer uh, on a price, uh, then there is a preliminary sale contract that is transmitted to the SAFER by the notary. That's a legal obligation. And when the SAFER receives this preliminary sale contract, it has two months to decide whether or not uh, it will activate this right. And if it activates this right, it means that uh, the SAFER will tell the, the, the owner, the seller, that uh, he will not sell to the buyer he had identified, but he will sell to SAFER. Obviously, this right is uh, very strictly, uh, uh, it must be, it, it, there are, uh, it, how, how can I say that? It's, it's very uh, strictly um, limited and it must be motivated by one or several objectives that are written in the French law. For example, we can activate this uh, right if we can say, we can prove that this land uh, that, would, that would be sold to, can, to build a house, uh, actually it's, uh, it could be useful to settle a farmer. That's an example of how we, could, we can use this right. Um, there is also the capacity when we activate this right to reduce the sale price. That, that means that we can ask the seller uh, to sell it at a lower price. Since 2014, uh, the preemption right was extended to sales of shares of agricultural, com agricultural companies only when 100% of these shares are sold together. Just a few figures about this preemption right. Uh, last year, there were uh, nearly 1,400 purchases through preemption out of uh, the whole annual purchases by SAFER. That's 12% uh, of, of what we buy. The rest is bought through amicable uh, negotiation. The procedure of uh, reduced price uh, has an impact that you can see uh, here on this uh, slide. Um, the possibility for SAFER to ask for a lower price has a direct impact on the level of, uh, of price in France. You can see in pink, uh, nearly at the bottom of the, the slide, uh, the, the mean price of arable land in France. So you see that uh, it's uh, nearly the, the, the lowest price across Europe. And that's a consequence, a direct consequence of the regulation by SAFER. The third part of a regulation is land allocation. Uh, so we, uh, SAFER implements allocation through uh, the purchase, the stock and the sale of land, but also by leasing facilitation. Uh, 
as you have understood, uh, allocation is, uh, we, we choose a candidate within the technical committee, then this allocation is approved by the board of director. And when we uh, sell uh, or if we make a uh, leasing contract, we can ask, we don't, we, we do it, we, we put a, a 10 year contract that guarantees that uh, the land will be used as agricultural uh, land. And for uh, specific contracts, we, we can also ask for a, a duration of up to 30 years. Uh, for instance, if we uh, want to protect environmentally a land, we can ask uh, that the land will be used uh, pr uh, with a specific environmental clauses. Just a few figures to, uh, for you to understand uh, what is the, the weight of SAFER activity uh, within the whole land market in France. The first line is what SAFER buy, uh, for instance, that's what they bought last year, uh, 103,000 hectares last year. Out of what uh, SAFER could have bought, that's 25% last year. 25% of the areas. So that's also uh, an explanation for the, the former slide because uh, when we buy land, we sell it at the right price and that's explained also why the, the, the prices are low in France because uh, SAFER activity weighs around 25% uh, of what is sold every year in France. Safer are then, first they buy, then they are able to stock land, and uh, this is very important because if we want to settle farmers, uh, we can stock land up to five years, and this is very important because it gives a possibility, for instance, to wait for the farmer to finish his education, or also to constitute um, a plot uh, sufficiently uh, big enough to settle the farmer, so that's a very important uh, possibility. And then in the end, Safer sale, uh, sell uh, land. And so you see in the, on the third line that uh, the major sales are uh, directed to agriculture and forests, uh, but also for local development and environment. I will uh, skip this one. Um, so what are, what are the challenges uh, for French agriculture? Uh, what I will tell you is really um, we, 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 make, uh, uh, we, we make statements based on our observation uh, of, of the rural land markets. There are two major challenges. First, the first challenge is, is the urban sprawl, the development of urbanization um, for uh, housing, public equipment, roads, railways. You can see on this slide uh, in blue what's a fair record every year um, of agricultural and natural land sold to be urbanized. And in red, that's the, the total areas uh, effectively urbanized every year. And so you can see that after the, the financial crisis burst out in 2007, areas declined, but for four years now, they have, uh, they have been going up again. And that's a, a very big concern for us. The second concern, uh, and that's the major one, that's the fact that the current regulation uh, does not stop land concentration. Um, in France nowadays, we can distinguish four ways to access land. If, if you're a farmer and you want to farm land, there are four ways you can do that. There's the land market, which is the historical uh, real estate market. Land renting, share deals, that is to say, um, to buy shares of agricultural companies and there is contract farming. I will not go into details, uh, I don't have time for this, uh, about this slide, but you see that the land market, the first line, is the best regulated market in France because, because the, the regulation was created to regulate this market. Uh, at that time, there was only this market. Uh, nowadays, three other markets have uh, appeared, and the most problematic one uh, is the third one, share deals. Uh, why, why is it a problem? Uh, because in France, you may know that, and it's a European trend, there are less and less individual farms and there are more and more agricultural companies. 
Um, these companies are very useful if you're a farmer and you want to transmit your farm to your son, for instance, because it enables you to do it progressively. But it also enables uh, the development of agricultural firms. Uh, what we call agricultural firms is a gathering of uh, several farms under um, one major shareholder. That's, the, that's what you can see on this slide. In red, you see the major shareholders. And this shareholder has uh, participations in one, two, three, four, five, six farms and other type, types of companies. This development of agricultural firms is directly related to the share deals and to the fact that the French regulation currently does not address well these, uh, these share deals. Just to give you some figure about share deals in France, that's the middle, mid column. Uh, there were 7,000 share deals recorded last year for 1.1 billion euros. In comparison, the, 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 the historic land market, it's 1,000 uh, transactions, 5.7 million. So you see that uh, the share deals, they only represent 7% of the land market, but 20% uh, in value of the, of the land market. So what is at stake is that uh, in France, uh, between 2020 and 2030, uh, one third of farmers will retire. Okay, and at the very moment when uh, the regulation uh, does not control share deals. And these share deals uh, enable an agricultural farm, firm sorry, to uh, take another farm, add it to its firm. So this deprives, uh, uh, this is an opportunity for a farmer uh, that he won't be able to settle and an agricultural firm will take the farm we could have used uh, to settle someone, okay? So this is, ve this is really um, the major issue in France. This will uh, accelerate land concentration, the expansion of agricultural firms. There will be less farmers and more employees across rural uh, areas, uh, less biodiversity and less vitality acro across rural territories. So there is, for us, uh, there is an urgent need for a, a renewed land regulation in France. We have already made proposals and we support uh, the farmland bill announced by our French president in February. Thank you. That's Antoine Pocorni, the director of the Anke company. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation in the first place. And I feel responsibility, competence, and we all feel that something is going on and we need to understand what's going on. Um, a great farmer and forester are influencing the quality and uh, the volume of water and the local climate. Enki is a god of Mesopotamia because we thought that if we go on like this, all water from our territory will disappear. So these are photographs from Mesopotamia and this is what we see every day. This is Syria. They were a flourishing civilization 6,000 years ago. And I believe to farmers, and this is a diagnosis, and towns could be established only because there were at the same place melioration and then only urban area was created. This is in Ethiopia five years ago. This was the Nile River. This is not a greenhouse effect. This is a former pasture. We cannot go back to the forest because forest 
can make a living for one or two people for square kilometer and we've fell forests so that we had arable land. We have changed the landscape and again I'm not attacking farmers, I'm stopping but town of Beneshev and you measure the temperature of the field and there is 48 degrees centigrade. So we should say civilizations are drying out and perhaps we are repeating their mistakes. Ten years ago we used a thermovision. Up there it's in this, you see there was a forest it's a landscape near the town of Trebon, and down there, there are 28 degrees centigrade and 42 degrees centigrade. It depends on the type of the landscape. Then the surface temperature is according high. If we offer to the sun just rooftops, and the air is hot. If we offer to the sun the landscape with vegetation, the air is much cooler. Let me just repeat that. We are measuring the sun energy in watts in meter, square meter. And if there is a full daylight, we can measure more than 1,000 watts. So for one square kilometer, it's the output of the nuclear power plant. And to evaporate one liter of water, I need to have 1.7 kilowatt hour. So I have one liter, I add one kilowatt hour, and I have a water uh, which evaporates, and this is a climate air condition, and this is the capacity of the car battery. So 12 volts of car battery with 50 ampere hours, and the result is 600 winter hours. If one liter of water evaporates, it's hidden energy the same as it is in a car battery. Během jasného dne na vodorovné ose je čas. Na svislé ose je intenzita slunečního záření až do 1000 W. Ta tlustá čára ukazuje, jak to vypadá během dne, čili v poledne máme kolem 1000 W. A když se zatáhne, tak máme třeba jenom 100 W. Čili kolik dostáváme sluníčka, to záleží na this is just to illustrate how we arrived at uh, our conclusions. If we uh, build a parking lot from a meadow, the 500 watts per square meter that uh, radiate on the area uh, will uh, heat uh, the, the surface and thus we increase the area of totally dry land. This is the Temelin nuclear power station and the heat incident on several square kilometers is about uh, the same amount of energy as, uh, as that generated by the, by the nuke. So we can, we can measure solar energy, 877 watts per square meter, 57 degrees. And under a tree, it's just 26 or 27 degrees. And the, the, the tree has just evaporated 20 liters per hour. And if you take this 
uh, if you take this amount as a unit, then the uh, the the um, the tree was cooling about as much as five air conditioning units, you know, from your hotels or from your flats. The heat is then contained in the vapor and that will condensate where it's cooler. Now we are getting to the forest. Look at the look at the maze. There are no weeds there, so the surface heat, uh, the surface temperature is 50 degrees. In the in the in in the forest, the, it's cool on the surface, and it's uh, warmer up in the air. So. The coolness stays there, it keeps there. So, going to the forest. This is from a study about 15 years ago. The question was, uh, how does the water circulation uh, look like in various parts of the world. Uh, the precipitation in Congo is uh, about 3,200 millimeters per year, and that drops down to inland. You can look at Amazonia or at the Mackenzie River. Well, well there's a lot of forest. Uh, well, there's no forest, the precipitation goes down to zero. Uh, the forest evaporates water, but it does so very slowly. You remember the, the fogs over forests in the mountains. Then the temperature keeps dropping uh, with, with height about a degree centigrade per 100 meters until the vapor cools down and drops in rain. You know that it usually rains in the afternoon in, in the mountains. This is what it looks like when the uh, land surface is cool. If if we deforest too much, then uh, there's heating instead of cooling, and uh, the air will take humidity out of the soil. This is known from summertime weather forecasts. When the forecast says that uh, it, sh it should be raining in a few days' time, but the, the water evaporates and never falls down again. So there are acceptor areas where the ascending flow of humidity prevails, and then there are donating areas. Here are samples of the effect of deforestation, for example, in, on the Borneo Island. So, time and precipitation on the two axes. And you, you can see the drop of precipitation, drop of rainfall 
after deforestation. So gradually the rainfall drops and we do not need to explain that by carbon dioxide. Uh, it's purely attributable to what we've done to the, uh, the land surface. Then, of course, it, it will, uh, the torrential rains will happen, and that is water that uh, will never get as far as our country, because we have too few cool places in Europe. So the question is whether we should accept the idea that we change uh, the climate by doing something with the uh, soil coverage. Uh, it's quite a, a, a ridiculous idea if we decide that we, we should fell forests to not, not to burn coal. Uh, in order to avoid the burning of coal. Uh, that, that reminds me of Dr. Semmelweis in Budapest, where there were two hospitals. Semmelweis si řekl sakra, oni mi sem chodí z patologie a on jim nechal mít ruce. There were two hospitals, one uh, with good sanitary conditions, the other with less good sanitary conditions. They, they discovered that people should wash their hands, as uh, Dr. Pasta discovered a little later in France. So, the farmers say that uh, there's never rain on a dry field. That is easily explained by uh, the ascending flow of evaporation. We admit that we are losing uh, water by evapotranspiration. But then we say that it's attributable to CO2. Here is a dry field and here is a forest. The dry uh, field looks innocent. There's hardly any moisture that can evaporate there. But uh, it's an ascending flow. Uh, so it uh, begins to dry the forest, and then comes uh, the bark beetle. The, the brown soil here is uh, dry land, maybe the parking lot. Then the, the thermal flow goes up. It, sucks air also from the sides. That's very uh, attractive uh, glider airmen for flyers. But then this moisture may flow to the sea. If we want to understand the climate, we have to be concerned with land cover, the distribution of solar energy and water vapor. That's a way to understand the whole process. Bark beetle, that is a disaster. But we are still talking whether uh, uh, the drying of the forest matters or not. But the difference in temperature between dry forest and 
healthy forest is, is formidable, something like 25 degrees. Uh, this shows the increase of temperatures during the day. In fact, we converted a cooler into a radiator. This is no good. And it shows some discrepancies in, in science. You can find on page 666 six, six, that it doesn't matter whether there's a, a lot of water vapor in the air or not, the, uh, because the water, uh, uh, the, the, the air mass uh, is changing, is, is circulating. So it, it should, all, all be attributed to carbon dioxide. But uh, I would rather stop here. We should stop desertification. We should return the natural function to the landscape. What Mr. Blahinka said sounded like uh, an attractive vision. Because a smarter production of food could improve uh, the retention of uh, humidity in the landscape. So I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, the last speaker is Mr. František Jonáš. Takže děkuji za slovo. Já ještě, než bych začal to téma moje, tak bych se tak trochu vrátil. Thank you. Before starting to talk about my subject, I would like to return to the forest theme. About 42 years ago, I took part in the investigation of forest problems in the Ore Mountains. This was forest damaged by industrial emissions, but it was much like a uh, bark beetle. Uh, uh, spruce monoculture was uh, replaced with other vegetation because spruce could not survive. Not, not only forest uh, soil is being heated, but also soil in fields, and that all attacks uh, organic matter in soil, in fact, distilling it or mineralizing it. And uh, the humus clay complex is destroyed by that. Uh, and the result of the destruction uh, was observed uh, in the water reservoir Přísečnice, where the quality of water deteriorated very significantly uh, because of the degradation of uh, human acids. And for four or five years, these acids 
we're destroying or spoiling the water in the reservoir. Uh, the same is going on today around uh, the reservoir of Schwehof in the uh, on the border between Bohemia and Moravia. Vytváří to, že tam přestávají být lesy, někdo the forest disappears there and the quality of soil around the reservoir suffers. My subject is somewhat related. The soil reserve of Europe and the Czech Republic is subject uh, is deteriorating and not just in Europe it's uh, a worldwide phenomenon twenty fifteen was the international year of soil and uh, I was reading the, the, the studies relating to it. I could see that the, the scientists were indeed investigating and were explaining, but there was hardly anyone to take decisions accordingly. Huh? Uh, at this point, I have two quotes here, a philosopher and a politician. Uh, uh, Karl Marx wrote that society, nation, or all societies together are not owners of the earth. They should just be the keepers and let the, the decent inherit it. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said the nation that uh, destroys its own soul destroys itself. Ninety percent of our food comes from the soil. So we should find alternative resources, and together with increasing number of population, there might be a situation that more than 900 million people will be hungry and 80 million people is born every year and the efficiency of fertilization is reduced and that results in lower yields so we could witness famine there are different proposals and what Mr. Blahinka had said, there are other systems like aquaponia or other. You can breed fish and this is also a whole system which saves water. They use it in Israel and they've implemented partially the same project in Slovakia. Actually, what's going on in the world and why our civilization exists is because of agriculture. Agriculture was based in soil. So what we are living through in the world is given by the fact that from human hunter became human gatherer and human farmer. So 
it has brought us to the crossroads, what we are living through. And it's not only crossroads vis-à-vis -vis to soil, it's a crossroads in resolving crises, starting with wars and famine ending. Today, I haven't heard anyone saying about the basic equation of life on the Earth, which is photosynthesis. We've heard about carbon trials, <clears throat> and it is necessary to say that, apart from the soil, we need also light from the sun, and we need the energy which is transformed through the soil into foodstuffs. And plants are growing in the soil, and the light and chlorophyll creates sugar, oxygen, and water. It is necessary that to see that we are chasing the carbon trail, and that creates lots of nervosity among people. <clears throat> and people are nervous, even smart people with potential are upset because of carbon. Actually, they say that production of CO2 is farmers' fault. I read some materials and it said that 24% of CO2 is produced by agriculture, 22% produces industry, but people keep forgetting that farmers are working with chlorophyll and in the balance of 28%, they are giving it back. So it's 40% plus, and they are actually erasing that carbon trail, which industry is not doing. So let me get to the point, to the soil. If someone asked me which country had the best concept of resolving problems with soil and pedology and genetics of soil had started with this man on the photograph. He looks odd. It's Vasily Dokuchayev. And he came as the first to say that the geology of the last thousand years when the soil started to be created is worth researching and he actually identified processes that created soil. Here is the way we see the soil profile. It's assessed in different way. For a farmer as such, our company was paying attention to soil. First, it was a complex survey of soil, and we've assessed more than 700 probes. And for the Czech Republic, for Czechoslovakia, then we've created a soil map. This is a profile of soil which shows that the humus layer is just below the plants. And you can find this type of profile only in forest and on grassland meadows, because in arable land it's all mixed and only 
the parental material stays. The erosion that belongs to degradation processes reduces the profile by one meter and when we speak about the arable land, the farmer is actually grazing the parental material and the proportion of fine particles erases and that's exactly what creates humus and clay profile and humus will be flushed away and clay remains. It means that the acid reaction is increased. This is what I've mentioned, that pedosphere is the upper layer which was created due to microorganisms and we created soil creating elements and this is the composition of the soil. The organic part is extremely important and we are losing it. It's got some Eighty percent of the humus and organic mass got into the soil by organic fertilization. Today we've heard people saying that we need to resolve the breeding of cattle. We had 3.5 million of heads of cattle. It's one unit per hectare. Now we have half of it. That means we have just half of the organic matter and we have 517 biomass facilities and for one biogas unit is equal to 400 hectares of soil and the organic matter is better than manure. It's not true because it worsens the quality of the soil. In the past, when the cattle was grazing in the fields, the situation was better because there was a clover which attracted nitrogen and that enriched the soil by organic mass. When I was getting ready for this conference, I was surprised by a fact that we are criticizing a rapeseed and in the table saying which plant brings most organic mass per hectare, I thought that it will be corn or grain, but rapeseed is bringing 1,600 kilo per hectare and alfalfa as well. What does it mean? In 1976, when someone created the table, he simply plotted figures which were surprising as of today. The soil as such has a rich life. If you grab a handful of soil, there is so much life as on this planet. It contains 20 cows on the hectare. Well, I've mentioned the literature and 
This used to be my hobby, the bonitation units, land assessment units, and that created for the farmers the way how to behave. And we needed a land evaluation to get a price of land, but we need all parameters of current agriculture. And some of these parameters simply disappeared because farmers are in a situation that they are not capable of responding to everything that the market dictates them. It's not that they wouldn't like to understand the soil, but there are so many owners of the soil or farmers are working on leased soil that they are not that interested. So this is the structure. And thanks to them, you can set or identify a set of parameters. <laughs> This is the soil analysis in the Czech Republic. And the arable land is diminishing. And the dent over there, well, it was just due to the more precise register. And I was mentioning a degradation. And you can see that on this slide. And in Europe, is the situation the same? And I've also mentioned forests and protection functions of soil. I've mentioned that we need at least 0.8 of cattle unit per 100 hectares. And we need to cover the soil by plants so it wasn't bare. And we need to be able to plant different plants so that the soil was covered, not bare. The map shows the best area for growing plants, and the acidity is given by a negative pH, by logarithm of the content of oxygen ions. What's important, this ratio C to N should be 10. And you see in Scandinavia shows the green color. And the quality of soil and stability is lacking even there. And I think that. This was all mentioned here today. So I'm sorry I was lagging behind speaking about the forest. Well, thank you. And now the former. Deputy Economic Director of Slushovice, Mr. Horta. I would start with current situation of agriculture in the Czech Republic and other state of the East Europe. After 89, it competed with countries of Western Europe because European Union contributed by funding them. Czech agriculture in the transformation period after 1990 wasn't getting any subsidies. We were getting overproduction with dumping prices and demanding productions like vegetables or cattle breeding wasn't able to cope. And 
the reduction of domestic production was a result because since 89 it had stabilized on 70 percent of the original level the agricultural production was better off at 60 percent there was a change in structure of production, but my colleagues have already mentioned that. That's why I just had one graph, and you can see that intensive plants like potatoes and vegetables was not very favorable. It was 40% of the original production, and vegetables are 50% of the original production. Cattle breeding was affected as well, so the production is something like 40% of the original situation. Milk production 60%, only poultry production increased by 40%. The reduction of agricultural production and structural changes caused the fact that the Czech Republic ceased to be self-sufficient, even if we have a potential to be self-sufficient. The overproduction at present is in grain, rapeseed, milk and beef. And in case of potatoes is 83% and fresh vegetables 40, pork 80, poultry 74 and eggs 85. In 1989 we were self-sufficient in all products. The poor balance is in vegetables because there is a negative balance of the foreign trade amounting to 11 billion crowns and in fruits 13.1 billion Czech crowns. For vegetables we have good conditions in the Czech Republic and we have a famous vegetable growing areas in many regions, but overflowing of cheap vegetables from the EU at the beginning of 90s caused the reduction of the situation. As you see on the graph, in 2017 we've produced just half of vegetables, cauliflower 9%, cabbage and uh, tomatoes, garlic only lower percentage of the original values. The agriculture of the old member states has been developing continuously and the production has been growing. In 1990, uh, the corporate structure uh, was changed in the early 1990s, the, the, the production technology also changed and the opportunities have been used more efficiently. According to the official results of, uh, 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 of a survey in 2014, the total production per hectare in the Czech Republic uh, was 72 percent of the uh, uh, EU level and 73 percent of the level of Germany. In comparison to Germany, we are at 40 percent in milk and uh, uh, at 36 percent in meat. We have heard that the uh, number of stock units has dropped, as the diagram shows. We export cereals rather than uh, using it to feed livestock. 
Now about the intellectualized services. Agriculture is seen as a part of the primary sector. So according to some, it should just deal with produce. And leaving uh, more intellectual services to others, but that would prevent farms from improving their profit, their profitability. Uh, subsidies have been seen as a favorable factor, but it's rather per area than per production. So how should Czech agriculture develop to rejoin the family of successful countries? According to uh, Professor Chuba, we can only do well if we improve, if we increase the production or reduce costs. So, uh, most promising uh, resources are in improved knowledge or application of inventions. So, that is what some uh, would call intellectualized services. What are they? Uh, Norwegian economist uh, Lowendale uh, uh, studied them in detail. Uh, according to what she wrote, uh, they are knowledge-based services rendered by uh, graduates, usually focused on the development of scientific knowledge in the relevant area of expertise. They involve a higher degree of uh, services to order. They require a large amount of independent work and personal judgment of experts rendering the services. They usually require detailed interaction with the client of the firm. So that involves not just the, the knowledge accumulated in research institutions, but also in individuals. Intellectualized services also inevitably include uh, various unpatented ideas and other stimuli of improvement of organization and management as well as uh, methods of financing and trading. This is a diagram of what I have just described. Knowledge-based services, new technology of solutions, organization, management, activation, financing, trade, ideas, and improvements. The intellectualized services are rendered by groups of experts to solve a complex problem on the basis of the latest knowledge. And this group should not just offer a solution, but in fact uh, realize it. And after completion, the same team can uh, move on to do the same on another farm. So it is a complex process, what we see by uh, under intellectualized services. It's something comparable to the new railroad, Chinese railroad to Tibet. The development of 
agriculture as present is a complex problem. The complexity is uh, uh, due to strong competition, competition uh, competitive environment, uh, the, the large amount of, of new findings and new knowledge in biology and related sciences, and therefore it requires cooperation of a large number of experts. Intellectualized services are the perfect solution to this. Uh, production of field vegetables can provide a good example of what I've been talking about including the proposal of uh, a system not only of production but also of irrigation, uh, uh, of post-processing, of marketing and the like. Uh, in including sales trajectories, planning, uh, development of an information system, training of growers and the intellectualized services should uh, trigger of the management of the whole process and then handing it over to the farm establishment. Uh, Florist production could be approached in the same way. Hydropony is a good example. It's four fruit greenhouse or aquaculture or aquapony. This kind of productions would inevitably require intellectualized services. Improvement of animal husbandry and production of beef. Uh, that is also a demanding program if we should uh, attain the level of uh, such neighboring countries as Germany or Austria. In the last few years, we've been exporting about 90,000 tons of beef per year, and at the same time importing uh, 41,000 tons. The uh, total of farmland has hardly changed at all in the recent past, so we do not uh, intensively use the land we have. Moreover, we have a surplus of cereals which uh, could be profitably used for increased uh, uh, meat production. Uh, mountainous areas were used for grazing in the past. This, this kind of activity is discontinued. And uh, maize is used more for uh, the production of biogas than as fodder feedstock. 
Thanks, another need for intellectualized services. The production of pork needs um, improvement of the sales structure for the product. to add value to livestock production, to improve the quality classification of cattle and develop specialized productions, introduce up-to-date modern animal husbandry. observe modern principles in pasture grazing. Uh, it, it is for, uh, further necessary to improve the production of feedstock which should be adjusted to local conditions. And the only additional feedstock should be purchased from outside. Information systems are also necessary. And there has to be a lot of cooperation with specialized services, expert services. Who should initiate and uh, uh, warrant uh, these intellectualized services? Well, schools, colleges, research institutions, and specialized companies. So far, we have no such specialized companies in our agriculture. So the government should step in and uh, include such services in subsidy programs. The European Commission should warrant uh, the implementation of such programs in agriculture. And the, these, these should be extended, the, the intellectualized services should be extended to uh, all sectors of agriculture through the activities of uh, the European Commission, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot to all speakers. We have some questions here. Question for Mr. Pokorny. Is there a study for costs to cut emissions of CO2 in transportation and industry vis-à-vis -vis to planting new forests to achieve the same effect? I would know how to plant new forests, but even if I'm meeting people who are affected by changes in automotive industry, I think they do not have any figures. I can speak about forests because there is this equation of photosynthesis. In one year, if the forest grows well, it creates half a kilo of biomass in a dry form, and that contains 0.65 CO2, or 40 percent out of this biomass. So these calculations are simple. And if the agriculture was doing what we need, it means 
increasing the amount of organic elements in the soil, then the emission balance would improve, whether it is the main cause or not. So we can improve the soil in any case. Safer Company, in the Czech Republic, 80% of farmers is farming on a leased land. Could, do you think that your system could help to stabilize the agricultural production? So if I understand well, 80% uh, is the amount of farmers uh, who rent land, that's correct? Yeah, correct, yes. correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, in France, it's about two-thirds two -third of, uh, of farmers who actually rent uh, uh, land. So one, there is one-third of uh, owners, of farmers' owners. And on the one farm, there is a, a mix, uh, generally. Uh, the farmer will own... Uh, the buildings and a, a part of uh, of the land and the rest can be rented to uh, one or several owners. And Safer actually uh, worked for, um, on, this, on this topic. For instance, when we have to transmit uh, a farm uh, between a seller and uh, a buyer, uh, there is this issue of the, the part of the land that is rented and we can make the connection uh, so that when the farm is, we can make the connections between the several owners and the future uh, farmer so that uh, the whole farm is transmitted and so that uh, not, not, the, not the only part that is owned by the seller but uh, the part that is owned and the part that is rented. We can tr transmit the whole farm uh, thanks to our, uh, the tools we have, uh, Safer. OK, thank you. Tak, ďalšia otázka je na pana... Next question for Mr. Pokorny. What could a single farmer do to curb the impact on water cycle without damaging his own farm? Well, that's the problem without damaging your own farm, because I'm living in the rural area and I do not know what will be on the market in five years. And you know, the point is that we are coming back to the very beginning. And the last question for Mr. David. In your opinion, is the membership of the Czech Republic in the European Union a benefit for our farmers? Well, that is a complex question. Of course, if right now we would leave the European Union without any changes, then for our farmers it would be very unfavorable because they are not ready for such a change. We are in the European Union for 15 years and during the time the agricultural production are used to certain conditions. I do not want to compare that with a marriage of 15 years because the man and woman cannot be satisfied with everything. But if the balance will help, if they do a divorce or not, well, it's difficult to decide. I think that the sudden departure from the European Union without any related changes would be unfavorable. And if I look at the balance from the viewpoint of changes which were unfavorable for our agriculture, because before we enter the EU, it could look like liberation, so to say, from the EU 
could be good, but we have to realize we are living in the middle of Europe and we have to live with our neighboring countries. So we have to focus on not being affected by unfavorable decisions of the EU. So this is what we should do in the first place. But I have to say that there is no proof that conditions should be improved in the future. I think this is not the case. And agriculture is affected by the fact that we have a different structure than number of comparable countries. A current commissioner for agriculture in his speech twice mentioned the difference between Czech Republic and Poland. Czech Republic has companies with 132 hectares and in Poland it's 95.5 hectares. So conditions are very different and the European Union is not considering these differences and regularly we keep hearing that the worst what could happen for the positive development of the EU is that the decision making would come back even partially to individual member countries. So what to do with this clash of interests, what could be advantageous for us and what not. Because those changes that we perceive as unfavorable has happened quite long ago. And to set it right, while that wouldn't be easy and it would be a long process. So you should have given me some better question. Unfortunately, this was not the case. So let me thank all panel members, all presenters, especially those who were keeping their time schedule. I think all presentations were interesting and I was warned that people will start disappearing in the afternoon. Anyway, what we've heard here is on the video. It will be available in Czech and English and on the Facebook post of the conference there will be presentations. So if you were not able to show all your interesting diagrams. You can find them on this Facebook page. And I believe that we can assess this conference as a successful one because our expectations were fulfilled and next year we'll repeat this conference and I hope we'll have more time to prepare the conference because three months is not enough for organizing a conference, as you know. So I believe that we'll meet here or at another hotel with some a bit different program and we'll get to something more, get to know something more about agriculture. So thank you very much for being so patient and listening to us and let me thank speakers for sharing their knowledge with us. Thank you.